Yes, we can see your screen now. Great. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, the presentation today is on cerebral endoscopy, current scope and technical considerations. I have no disclosures related to this uh, uh, presentation. Endoscopic procedures uh, uh, for intracranial lesions can be classified into endoscopic endochannel procedures, endoscope-assisted procedures, and endoscope controlled procedures. The endoscopic endochannel procedures are those which are performed through a strategically placed uh, uh, burr holes and the whole surgery is uh, performed uh, by the instrument passing through the working channel of the uh, endoscope into the uh, surgical target. And the majority are used for intraventricular uh, pathologies and examples of these uh, include uh, endoscopic third ventriculostomies, endoscopic septostomies, uh, tumor biopsies, small tumor excision, also ablation or management of choroid plexus cysts and uh, endoscopic foraminotomies. The endoscope assisted procedures are those uh, in which the surgical microscope is the main visualizing tool that is used during the procedure and the endoscope is used as an adjunct in order to uh, gain visualization in some areas which are not properly seen by the microscope, like for example, uh, uh, looking around the corners or having a look on perforators, whether they were included in an aneurysm clip, for example, in aneurysm surgery and so on. And the last uh, 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 part of the classification is the endoscope controlled procedures, which are uh, uh, um, performed exclusively using the uh, rigid endoscope as the visualizing uh, tool. And there is no surgical microscope is used during these uh, procedures. And I will be uh, elaborating on uh, these in the second part of my presentation today. So uh, for now, let me let me uh, uh, discuss about uh, a couple of important technical points in uh, some endoscopic endochannel uh, uh, procedures. The first is endoscopic third ventriculostomy, which is of course absolutely the most commonly practiced maybe uh, uh, endoscopic procedure in our uh, everyday uh, practice. It's a, a very uh, classical and old thing. However, important surgical tricks should be taken in consideration in order to have an effective and uh, 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 complication-free uh, uh, procedure. The first point is to choose a trajectory that is planned as parallel as possible to uh, the clivus. As you can see here, this gives you an impede, unimpeded view into the prepontiensis turn while passing through the foramen of Monroe, and this avoids uh, uh, having to uh, uh, exert much torque on the neurovascular structures around the uh, uh, foramen, and then the uh, point of the burr hole is extrapolated on the external uh, surface. Also, another important point is the transgyral entry point. It is much, much better to uh, uh, choose a transgyral entry point because choosing an, a, a transsulcal one exposes the vessels which are lying in the depth of the sulcus uh, to trauma and uh, 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 having uh, complications. And if you look at this uh, uh, three-dimensional uh, model, uh, we will understand that the lateral ventricles are uh, um, rather uh, uh, midline structures. So approaching them with a paramedian structure is uh, uh, very uh, uh, preferable. Neuronavigation, of course, is uh, uh, very important and it enables preoperative planning of, op of optimal entry site and trajectory with a precise and real-time control of the endoscope advancement during the procedure. Of course, it cannot be present in all time, in all cases, in all centers maybe, uh, and we have to put this in consideration. So in that case, we resort to the uh, standard uh, classical Kocher's point, uh, uh, which we all uh, know for the entry point. The patient is uh, head is elevated 15 to 20 degrees above the level of the heart, and uh, some degree of uh, uh, head flexion is also uh, uh, very helpful in reaching uh, the floor. Now, after entering the uh, lateral ventricle, the important anatomical structures at the level of the foramen of Monroe that should be identified are the choroid plexus and the thalamus triate vein, 
of course the uh, uh, column of the fornix and the foramen as well as the septum pellucidum and the uh, uh, septal vein, which is not so evident here in this uh, 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 case. Uh, the next level is at the level of the floor. Importantly, we have to identify the mammillary bodies and the basilar tip and its branches if the uh, uh, floor is transparent enough to show them, and the dorsum cilli as well as the infundibular recess and most uh, anteriorly the uh, chiasmatic recess. After opening the floor, the prepontine cistern uh, uh, level is uh, characteristically showing the basilar artery, the dorsal surface of the uh, uh, clivus, and the pons and the perforators. Here is a video of the classical uh, 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 procedure. The endoscope is navigated within the lateral ventricle at the region of the foramen, and then the foramen is entered, and here is a glimpse uh, uh, of the of the uh, aqueduct of Sylvia seen down the the uh, uh, basilar uh, 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 branches the terminal branches of the basilar artery are seen here and a blunt instrument usually a dex forceps or a closed uh, uh, biopsy forceps like in this case is used to puncture the floor better to uh, uh, go more anteriorly just posterior to the uh, 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 dorsum cilli. And then a Fogarty's catheter number two or number three uh, is, is uh, uh, used to enlarge the initial opening. It is much better to stay, give yourself a couple of seconds uh, across the uh, opening in order to get a, a large opening at the uh, end and also to decrease the uh, ooze from uh, the uh, uh, opening of the floor of the third ventricle. Another example here with a very transparent very transparent uh, uh, floor. You can see the two P1s and the basilar perforators. The same technique is applied. N note that it is not in the middle of the uh, uh, point between the mammillary bodies as it was described uh, classically previously. It is closer to the dorsum cilli. It is much safer, more convenient, and the inflation here opens the uh, uh, membrane of Liliquist as well as the tuber cinerium which is the, the, the floor of the third ventricle, and you stay for some uh, time until you get it. And here is the view into the prepontine uh, pre cistern, and the basilar artery is seen, and the undulating floor, which indicates uh, a good flow, and then the endoscope is uh, uh, withdrawn. Uh, the, the next issue I would like to address is the liliquist membrane. We all know that the liliquist membrane is having Two mainly two components, the diencephalic and the mesencephalic leaves, which are represented here on this uh, 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 illustration. Uh, it is of note that the liliquist membrane is having so many variations in its anatomy, but the most important point that is relevant to uh, endoscopic third ventriculostomy is that it should be completely uh, uh, penetrated in order for the ETV to be uh, successful. Here is a video of the procedure, the same technique passing uh, at the posterior part of the dorsum and opening uh, the tuber uh, cinerium. You can observe that that the, the, the uh, uh, forceps is having some uh, degree of resistance, which is uh, uh, in many cases uh, uh, found when the liliquist membrane is encountered. So uh, uh, an opening of the uh, floor is uh, performed and then the Fogarty scat is negotiated through the initial small opening within the liliquist membrane in order to enlarge it. Partial, open, partial inflation of the uh, uh, of the uh, uh, Fogarty scat is uh, performed again and again and staying for some time and so on. This, in most of the cases, is sufficient to uh, get the liliquist membrane open. However, in this case, as you can see here, it is not yet open. There is a large band here, and it is not open. So a scissors is uh, used to open the liliquist membrane. Note that the blades are directed in an anteroposterior uh, uh, direction, which is safer uh, uh, to uh, uh, use. And the liliquist membrane is uh, cut even resisting the scissors, and now it is completely uh, open and uh, a view into the stoma and the, the, pre, uh, the uh, prepontine cistern and the basilar artery are uh, uh, obtained. Now, the classical technique 
that has been described is that the floor of the third ventricle is performed between the infundibular recess and the anterior border of the mammillary bodies, which means it is uh, somewhere in, in, in this distance here. This is the mammillary body and the infundibular recess, and it should be open here. But have a look, please, on the uh, sagittal MRI that is shown here. The basilar artery is uh, uh, completely touching, almost touching the uh, posterior aspect of the clivus. So there is no space for the uh, ETV to be performed. And these are the cases in which we call the uh, small or zero uh, uh, prepontine distance or PPD. And the solution is the dorsum cilli, which is a very important landmark that can be visualized and palpated with the, uh, when the uh, prepontine distance is small or the floor is non-transparent. And it can be used as a point of initial opening of the third ventricle floor away from the risky vascular structures that lie beneath the tuber cinerium. On this MRI, you can observe here the dorsum cilli uh, uh, in that uh, uh, sagittal MRI. And here in this anatomical uh, uh, specimen, the dorsum cilli is present at the, uh, of course, at the top of the uh, clivus posteriorly and is in very close opposition to the floor of the uh, uh, third ventricle. The technique is uh, uh, that uh, a fenestration of the tuber cinerium is done by initial application of pressure against the dorsum cilli using a blunt instrument, and then the third uh, ventricle floor is open. Uh, uh, by negotiating the balloon catheter through the created opening and, and inflating its, uh, it to enlarge uh, the stoma. Here is one example in this very young uh, child with a quadrigeminal cistern arachnoid cyst. An ETV was done after an endoscopic cystoventriculostomy was uh, uh, performed. So I'll be, I'll be showing you here the part of the, uh, uh, the ETV. This is the uh, uh, the pituitary gland, the two anterior lobes, the posterior lobe, and the dorsum cilli. And this is the tip of the basilar branches. As you can uh, uh, see, there is no space for uh, uh, doing a standard uh, uh, ETV in the usual uh, way. So uh, uh, the the uh, the uh, uh, bipolar uh, probe in, in a mechanical way is used to apply pressure against the bone or the cartilage here in this very young child of the uh, dorsum cilli, it was not fully open. So the dex forceps was uh, uh, used to open the uh, uh, membrane. And um, with the change of the pressure differential, the membrane starts to undulate uh, uh, and move uh, away from the vessels. And by that time, you can pick it with the Fugarty's catheter and uh, inflate the balloon in order to achieve uh, uh, the stoma. And here is the view after the ETV has been uh, performed. In another example here in the lower left corner is a tectal uh, TB abscess with a secondary uh, uh, aqueduct uh, uh, stenosis. Here is the video of the procedure. Uh, upon entering the, uh, uh, the foramen and getting to the floor of the third ventricle, you can observe how the uh, uh, vessels are completely uh, 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 lying in opposition to the uh, dorsum cilli. So the uh, closed forceps is rotated and pressed uh, on the tuber cinerium against the dorsum cilli. This is the initial opening that took place. And with the change of pressure, it starts to move, as you can see here. And uh, uh, by that time, the Fogarty's cat can be uh, uh, moved into through the, the, the initial opening and uh, judiciously uh, inflated in order to uh, in increase the uh, diameter of the opening and do it properly. Of course, at a higher level than the uh, uh, level of the vessels to be in the safer uh, area away from them. And here is the final opening. One more example here, as you can see, the two P1s are uh, 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 very close to the dorsum cilli, just a very small clear uh, uh, area here on the right side. However, it was felt safer to open the uh, floor against the uh, uh, dorsum. Just a small pop with the instrument, just flush with the dorsum cilli, and then the uh, uh, forceps is open to increase uh, uh, the, uh, the, the opening. And then the Fogarty's cat enlarges the opening 
in uh, uh, the standard way. And here is a view. This is the P1. This is the superior uh, uh, cerebellar artery seen through the uh, opening. Another example, an adult, adult onset aqueduct stenosis, preoperative MRIs here with an epsilon uh, shape of the anterior third ventricle because of the high uh, pressure. And this is the uh, view after the MRI, postoperative MRI with uh, sharp angles of the anterior uh, uh, third ventricle, which we call the W uh, uh, shape of the uh, uh, anatomy. The same steps apply here uh, and, and a, a final view can be uh, seen. One more uh, case here with adult onset aqueduct stenosis too. The semi-phase contrast MRI here is uh, showing the flow uh, across the ETV at the white arrow. And on the sagittal uh, uh, T2 MRI, you can see the opening in the floor and how the uh, basilar artery is very uh, 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 closely uh, 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 opposed to the posterior part of the uh, uh, clivus. So in patients with an obliterated or reduced uh, prepontine distance, the ETV can be safely performed with this technique. And the success rate of ETV in these uh, patients is similar to the reported success rates in the others who have normal uh, prepontine distance. Now let me move to another uh, 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 thing in, uh, pertinent to the ETV is the simultaneous ETV and tumor biopsy for pioneer region. Uh, tumors. This strategy is actually minimally, minimally invasive and is very effective uh, in managing these patients initially because it addresses the issue of getting a tissue diagnosis and also offers a solution for the associated hydrocephalus that is frequently uh, encountered in these patients. A paradigm shift in the management of these lesions has took place uh, uh, after applying this uh, 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 strategy and uh, many, many of the formal craniotomies and shunting procedures have been excluded from the treatment algorithms in many of these cases. Of course, it is ideal to plan the uh, uh, trajectory and the entry point using the neuro navigation. However, you might do a single bore hole that is uh, two to three centimeters anterior to the standard Cochers point in order to uh, do an ETV and also reach to the tumor and take uh, the biopsy. Sorry. Uh, and the next is to do tuber holes that are made and then the ETV and tumor biopsy are performed through the separate burr holes. The ETV is uh, uh, done from the standard Cochers point and the biopsy is done from uh, a more anterior, far more anterior uh, uh, situated uh, 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 burr hole. Usually this strategy is needed when the uh, tumor is very well recessed posteriorly uh, in the uh, uh, pioneer region or the third ventricle or in cases with a very large massa intermedia, which impedes uh, uh, moving the uh, endoscope shaft to uh, uh, gain the biopsy. And here is a representation of the two strategies on this sagittal uh, T2 uh, MRI. The technique uh, of the, of the uh, biopsy is uh, 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 demonstrated here, in this case of a lipoastrocytoma of the pioneer region, and uh, this is a view, an initial view of the tumor. Four to three to five maximum uh, bites with the biopsy forceps are taken from the uh, tumor, and here is how it uh, uh, looks. One example case of a vinyl germinoma, pre-treatment, uh, pre-operative uh, MRI is shown here and uh, ETV and biopsy were done. And uh, uh, this is the post-treatment. He was treated by the oncology uh, colleagues after his, uh, his uh, hydrocephalus was uh, relieved and the uh, tumor was uh, diagnosed. Another example of a bronchogenic carcinoma metastasis to the pineal region with obstructive hydrocephalus. This is the flow of the uh, ETV after the uh, uh, biopsy and the, the uh, uh, ETV. Another case with a papillary tumor of the pineal region. The same uh, uh, principle, preoperative MRI is here. This is the immediate post ETV and biopsy. And after gaining this, uh, uh, histopathological diagnosis, he was sent for the gamma knife 
and receive the gamma knife uh, uh, immediately. This is the post uh, gamma knife in six months, and this is uh, the gamma knife uh, post treatment after one uh, year. He is currently in the third year without a recurrence and is doing uh, well. A couple of technical considerations in the uh, issue of the endoscopic tumor biopsy is that the rigid endoscopes, I personally prefer them. And they are more commonly used because of the larger diameter of the biopsy forceps, which uh, uh, increases the uh, uh, diagnostic yield. And also coagulation of the tumor uh, uh, should be avoided before sampling because these samples are usually small and it is uh, 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 it's, it, it can be uh, completely destroyed by the, uh, by the uh, 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 coagulation artifacts and also hemorrhage in these cases can be controlled with continued irrigation, balloon uh, tamponade or electrocautery or laser. And also one important advice is to take the biopsy after having done the ETV. So the ETV comes first because these people, these patients are having a, a very critical hydrocephalus that should be addressed uh, because in some cases, if you do the biopsy first, the uh, vision will be obscured and you will not be able to have a proper visualization for an ETV. Now, let's move to another uh, uh, pathology, the endoscopic management of choroid plexus uh, cysts, which are typically asymptomatic and represent abnormal folds of the epithelial lining of the choroid plexus. However, they may occur throughout the ventricular system and are more frequently originating from the glomus of the choroid plexus of the lateral ventricles. These MRIs are of a, a, a nine-year-old boy who uh, came to uh, a peripheral hospital emergency room with a Glasgow coma scale of 11 out of 15. He had a history of intermittent manifestations of high ICP and an external ventricular drain was inserted in that hospital. He regained his consciousness and he came to our care where we did uh, a CISS MRI uh, in addition to the standard uh, MRI protocol. And it revealed this uh, third ventricle uh, uh, cyst. As you can see it here in the sagittal uh, MRI, we actually uh, uh, decided to uh, operate him endoscopically and we reported the, that case to a uh, child's nervous system on the premise, on the, the main point for uh, that case report was that we were uh, uh, for the first time documenting the dynamic behavior of these uh, uh, cysts, which was previously just documented by real-time ultrasound. So please have a look at how it uh, uh, behaves, it kept uh, doing this all the time during uh, uh, the surgery, going to and fro, and uh, uh, the, the cyst wall was ablated using the bipolar uh, uh, here, as you can see, it uh, uh, was coagulated. And the, the, look at the hypertrophic vessel, uh, uh, choroidal vessel, that is uh, uh, one of the main feeders of the uh, enlarged and hypertrophic uh, uh, tissue. This is the main choroid plexus uh, uh, tissue in that uh, 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 patient. And it was shrunken and completely uh, 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 taken down by using the bipolar until the uh, clear foramen of Monroe. And here is a view of the aqueduct of Sylvius and the posterior third ventricle passing anteriorly. I actually decided to do an ETV in, in uh, that uh, uh, patient, although theoretically speaking, uh, the, the CSF pathway has been uh, 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 opened and it should not be in need. But however, I felt better to do uh, that, and here is the view. Post-operative MRI uh, revealed a very nice uh, decompression of the ventricular system and uh, uh, a good flow across the uh, uh, ETV and also across the aqueduct. I don't, I don't know if this is uh, uh, seen clearly or not, and the flow voids are seen here on the sagittal MRI. Next is the adult idiopathic obstruction of the foramen of Monroe, which is quite rare uh, pathology that has been uh, 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 reported for the first time in 1984 in, uh, 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 in, uh, uh, in the uh, anatomical coronal sections of a, a post-mortem case of a 52-year-old uh, male, they described asymmetrical dilatation of both ventricles and also a clear membranous 
uh, occlusion of the foramen of Monroe on one side and obstruction by the deviated uh, 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 septum pellucidum on the other side. It is a rare condition with only few cases described in the literature. Probably it is more frequently diagnosed in the clinical practice, but it is not so much reported. The obstruction of the foramen of Monroe could be caused by a membranous occlusion or by a true, a, a true atresia or stenosis of the uh, foramen of Monroe. The secondary obstruction of the foramen can be induced by the deviation of the of the uh, um, of the uh, septum pellucidum that encroaches upon the contralateral patent of, uh, foramen uh, of Monroe, leading to its occlusion. At times, uh, there is a bilateral occlusion that is uh, resulting in biventricular hydrocephalus and no non-deviated midline septum pellucidum and normal size of the uh, third ventricle, like in the images of this uh, case. We have treated that case uh, uh, previously. He was, she was, um, uh, a 21 year old uh, uh, female patient who presented with a Glasgow coma scale of 13 out of 15 and a history of intermittent high ICP for a couple of months and EVD was inserted in the other hospital and she regained uh, consciousness. We uh, uh, um, We did an MRI in our uh, hospital. Of course, this collapsed uh, uh, ventricle on the right side is because of the EVD that has been uh, inserted. And this is reformatted MR imaging, revealing the membranous structure, occluding the foramen of Monroe here on the uh, left. And uh, we did for her an endoscopic foraminoplasty. Here is the initial view at the uh, region of the foramen of Monroe. This is the left lateral uh, uh, ventricle and the choroid plexus is here. And this is the region of the foramen of Monroe. Just a very small opening can be uh, uh, seen uh, uh, when the ventricle was entered. So uh, a blunt forceps was introduced into the small uh, aperture of the membrane. And then a, a Fogarty's catheter. Enlargement of the balloon was undertaken. And sharp opening of parts of the uh, uh, membrane was performed. And then a final enlargement with the Fogarty's balloon catheter, again to uh, uh, complete the foraminoplasty. And here is the view of the uh, uh, completely open uh, uh, foramen of Monroe. Post-operative MRIs with normalization of the ventricle uh, uh, size and this appearance of the uh, membranous structures. The most frequent presenting symptoms in these patients include headache, memory impairment, gait disturbances, and urine incontinence. All cases show a few months onset of signs and symptoms or a sudden deterioration on top of a pre-existing clinical uh, condition and the delayed onset is probably as it happened in that case that I have just uh, shown is explained by the gradual compromise of the foramen of Monroe with readjustment of CSF uh, flow dynamics. There are as of uh, 2020, 16 cases have been reported in the literature uh, uh, with various uh, anatomical uh, 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 components causing the uh, obstruction. Our case should be regarded the fourth case because the bilateral membranous occlusion have just been reported in uh, three cases uh, previously. It should be uh, emphasized that although the uh, uh, endoscopic foraminoplasty is a minimally invasive uh, procedure. Severe complications like hemiparesis and memory deficits may take place after the surgery because of injury to the surrounding 
uh, structures. And I would like to uh, stress that true foraminal stenosis or atresia is not an indication for the procedure, in my opinion, because the risk of injury to uh, the neurovascular structures in the vicinity is very high. It should be reserved only for membranous uh, uh, obstruction and this is the uh, these are the images of the patient that I have shown uh, before when we were uh, discussing about ETV and uh, uh, here is a view of his uh, uh, MRI he had a quadrigeminal cistern arachnoid cyst this is the aqueduct and here is a view into the posterior uh, 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 third ventricle the uh, uh, the uh, uh, um, membrane, the cyst wall is very thick usually in this uh, area and bipolar coagulation is used. And the scissors completes the uh, opening. And here is a view into the superior uh, surface of the uh, uh, cerebellum. Uh, uh, and coming back to do the ATV that I have uh, uh, just uh, shown, post-operative MRIs are shown here. Now, let's move to the rotational technique for endoscopic excision of colloid cysts of the third ventricle. The, uh, this is a, a very important topic and a lot of controversy around the uh, endoscopic uh, uh, versus microsurgical colloid cysts of the third ventricle is uh, uh, there. I will not be discussing the, uh, uh, the literature in that regard, but uh, I think that the colloid cyst excision should be, uh, uh, should be done endoscopically uh, uh, until proven otherwise. And I will be elaborating on two uh, uh, approaches or variants of the rotational technique, the transforaminal and the transseptal interfornicial uh, approaches. The first successful surgical removal of a colloid cyst was performed by Dandy in 1922, and then microsurgery became the standard uh, treatment. More recently, endoscopic excision evolved into a highly effective and minimally invasive option that, as I have just mentioned, is here uh, to stay. The, uh, uh, the main and key uh, surgical steps for the endoscopic colloid cyst uh, 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 resection by the transforaminal rotational technique is as uh, follows. Neuronavigation is very uh, important. Coagulation of the choroid plexus and opening the capsule, which uh, content, whose content is aspirated and decompressed, and then the grasped capsule should be uh, uh, rotated in a small range, clockwise and anticlockwise uh, movements until it is dislocated from its attachment, and then uh, the whole thing is taken out, the colloid cyst and the grasping forceps, as well as the endoscope. Uh, shaft outside of the uh, field and then irrigation and hemostasis. Here is a video of the procedure, bipolar coagulation on the surface of the uh, uh, colloid cyst and sharp opening with the scissors, then aspiration of the contents to decompress uh, uh, the cyst. Bipolar coagulation is applied on the choroid plexus and on the surface of the uh, capsule if needed. It should be very uh, precise and meticulous to avoid injuries. And then the capsule is grasped with the grasping forceps. And as you can see here, small range, clockwise and anti-clockwise movements of the, uh, uh, of the forceps take the colloid cyst and dislocates it outside the uh, uh, field. The, uh, the, sorry, the uh, foramen of Monroe into the lateral ventricle. Of course, sometimes you might be encountering some uh, bleeding. You can stop this and do bipolar coagulation and then be back to hold it and rotate it uh, 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 according to the uh, uh, situation. Now it has completely separated and it is being taken out across the uh, track of the endoscope.
And here is the view into the resection area and the floor of the uh, uh, third ventricle. Pre and post operative MRIs are here, and the excised cyst is uh, shown. At times, as I have just mentioned, the uh, uh, situation is a bit more uh, difficult with bleeding. And one of the, the, the key uh, 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 surgical uh, technique to help with completing that is to do a patient and uh, prolong it. Uh, bipolar coagulation of the capsule and the attached uh, uh, choroid plexus. The capsule is grasped and rotated. And as you can see, it just dislocates and uh, uh, comes uh, out. Here is a view of the uh, third ventricle at the conclusion of the procedure. Post-operative MRIs are shown here in the uh, uh, lower panel. And one example of a very uh, uh, relatively simple uh, 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 colloid cyst with very fluid uh, uh, content, which makes life so much easier uh, uh, during aspiration, the uh, content is the, it just came out by itself into the cavity of the lateral uh, ventricle. It is being pushed, and then it is uh, grasped as uh, 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 I have just uh, shown rotational movements of the uh, uh, cyst, and then dislocation and taking it outside. And here is uh, uh, the uh, excision cavity. Another uh, case example with uh, uh, a pre-operative MRIs and post-operative MRIs on the lower uh, uh, part. The technique allows radical excision of many of the colloid cysts, actually in many of the patients, like in this example, pre-operative MRIs, post-operative MRI, and the resected cyst. Another example with pre- and post-operative MRIs and the uh, resected cyst, and uh, uh, so on. Also, hemorrhagic colloid cyst as an example here, pre and post operative uh, MRIs. We have uh, published our results in uh, World Neurosurgery in uh, 2019, and it was our conclusion that the high rotational, uh, uh, the high total excision rate and lower complication profile achieved in the current series. Uh, uh, in, is in concordance with the recent reports of endoscopic resection of colloid cysts of the third ventricle, and that the rotational technique for the endoscopic transforaminal approach is highly effective and safe alternative to the bimanual dissection uh, uh, technique. Also, with the continuously improving results and refined endoscopic techniques, we think that the claims of superiority of microsurgery to endoscopy for colloid cyst excision are highly likely to be refuted in the near future. Now, let me move to another category of uh, colloid cysts which lie above the level of the third ventricle. Here is one uh, uh, example. You can see how the uh, colloid cyst is above the level of the third ventricle. And uh, usually colloid cysts present clinically when they are relatively small owing to early obstruction of the uh, uh, foramina of Monroe. However, some of them attain large sizes and reach very high distance above the roof of the third ventricle by the time of clinical presentation and diagnosis. The observation that some colloid cysts develop above and are covered inferiorly by the velum interpositum has been made in old literature, like in these uh, papers by uh, Hall in 1913 uh, and uh, 29 and 32, but it was not much analyzed. Also, one, one uh, paper by uh, uh, Sherrick and Zevin from 1975 published in JNS, they uh, uh, found two colloid cysts above the diencephalic roof and occupying the space between the two furnaces and the two leaves of the uh, uh, septum uh, uh, pilosidum. And um, we analyzed the anatomical reasons for such uh, 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 phenomenon. And it seems that anatomical variations in the vicinity of the third ventricle floor uh, roof account at least partially for such features, and the culprit structures include the fornix, septum pellucidum, and velum interpositum. For this type of uh, 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 pathoanatomy, uh, a transseptal interfornicial uh, approach is uh, 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 suitable, and here is one example of uh, uh, one case, preoperative MRIs are shown here. Note that the level 
is that the colloid cyst is going above the level of the uh, 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 roof of the third ventricle with uh, occlusion of the foramen of Monroe that precludes uh, getting the scope into the foramen. Here is uh, a representation, a diagrammatic representation of the pathoanatomical features in these uh, uh, cases. The patient is positioned uh, uh, as usual, and the, uh, it is necessary to use the, the neural navigation, of course, and an elitons catheter that is connected to the whole suction with a three-way stopcock extension tube that I use even in the transforaminal approach. Of course, you may use uh, any of the available other uh, 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 endochannel uh, uh, instruments for uh, uh, tumor removal, like the uh, myriad uh, uh, device or uh, whatever. But anyway, the uh, the suction uh, control is very uh, effective uh, uh, way. I will not go into the key surgical steps, and I will be rather uh, showing you uh, the video. Here is the video of that case. Look how the foramen of Monroe is very uh, uh, occluded and obstructed and the bulging right septal leaflet by the tumor. So a septal window is performed in the uh, uh, leaflet of the uh, uh, septum pellucidum using the bipolar is initially open. Dix forceps is used to enlarge it a bit and open the uh, wall of the uh, 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 colloid cyst. The content is uh, showing here. And then the Nelitons catheter with beveled end and suction and controlled suction is uh, uh, used to uh, debulk the components within the tumor, within the uh, colloid cyst and, uh, uh, and the, the uh, solid material that is not uh, sackable can be destroyed using the forceps and then aspirated. Note the differential membranes that are surrounding the colloid cyst. In that case, some parts of the material falling into the lateral ventricle are uh, aspirated and more bipolar to uh, uh, devascularize the cyst. Rotational dislocation of the capsule is attempted at that point, but it is not uh, uh, working. And some uh, uh, choroid plexus tissue is exposed and it was bleeding. So uh, uh, an incidental choroid plexus cyst is seen here. So more coagulation of the choroid plexus And then again, the cyst wall is grasped and rotated. And this time it dislocates. Complete resection of the uh, uh, cyst wall is achieved. And this is an interfornicial view of the two foramina of Monroe from uh, 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 the interfornicial uh, uh, window. This was a, a part of one, one of our publications in the uh, collection that I edited. I was uh, the editor, the visiting editor for that collection in uh, child nervous system uh, recently. Another example of this uh, case for a transseptal interfornicial approach, also pre and post operative uh, MRIs. Here is uh, the uh, surgical video. I will not uh, keep it running uh, completely. For the sake of time, uh, um, here is a view at the posterior aspect. And the again, the very uh, uh, crowded foramen of Monroe uh, uh, because of the uh, because of the bulk of the uh, colloid cyst. A septal window is performed and the coagulated tissue is taken out even with the, uh, 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 the forceps and the content is aspirated with the uh, uh, controlled suction. And here is 
bipolar coagulation of some parts of the cyst wall. Actually, because of these very large vessels on the uh, 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 on the inner uh, 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 surface and that huge vein that have been uh, seen into that, sometimes they are so vascular, so it is better uh, not to be uh, uh, tried to be resected, and a patent for even of Monroe is uh, uh, seen at the end of the uh, procedure. And now let me move to the last part of my uh, uh, talk today, which is about the keyhole brain surgery under full endoscopic control or the uh, endoscopic controlled uh, 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 surgery. Endoscopic assistance in cranial surgery evolved out of the need to operate via small openings and yet obtain a proper visualization and control over these structures within the surgical field. And uh, the earlier experiences, as you can see in these uh, 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 papers, have shown that rigid endoscopes offered a solution to the problem of suboptimal visualization when such small openings are uh, used. And Professor Axel Brunetsky is actually to be credited for popularizing the keyhole concept in neurosurgery and stressing on the importance of the endoscopic assistance in this type of surgery by a very large number of case series and uh, 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 publications. So as optical instruments, the rigid endoscopes are characterized by a large depth of field which results in lesser need for frequent focus adjustment and also a wider field of view in comparison to the, uh, of course, in comparison to the surgical microscope, which results in the panoramic views that we all observe when we operate using them. And also they are brought closer to the surgical target with a higher uh, illumination and image definition. Additionally, angled endoscopes enable looking around the corners and visualization of concealed tumor components and looking at the uh, uh, perforators, which is needless to say, a very critical part of the cranial microsurgery. In principle, the endoscope controlled surgery, as I have uh, uh, pointed out, is a surgery through a keyhole that is uh, through keyhole openings that is uh, dependent completely on the rigid uh, micro, uh, endoscope. The rigid endoscope can be uh, held in uh, a mechanical holder or a pneumatic holder or used freehand by the assistant or even by the assistant uh, or even by the uh, operating uh, surgeons. At time, we can fix it to a, a semi-robotic arm like this one or a robotic arm. And uh, this is the uh, operating room setup that I use for the majority of the supratentorial uh, craniotomies. Here is the surgeon and here is the endoscope monitor uh, so that uh, uh, the view is uh, in that uh, direction. For the uh, retrosigmoid approach and posterior fossa approaches, the endoscope monitor is put across uh, uh, the table and here is the uh, arrangement. I will be sharing with you a couple of cases in which this uh, surgical strategy was uh, uh, utilized. Uh, the first case is a tuberculum cell meningioma in a 33-year-old lady who presented with severe visual loss more on the uh, left side. This is the preoperative MRI, and uh, um, here is a video of the uh, procedure. She was operated via uh, uh, an, uh, uh, an eyebrow approach on the left. The tumor is bipolar coagulated and separated, uh, devascularized from its uh, attachment at the skull base. And uh, uh, the forceps is used to uh, uh, develop the uh, arachnoid plane. The arachnoid is the dressed, uh, uh, teased away from the surface of the tumor, which is very important. A glimpse of the, uh, of the uh, left optic nerve can be seen here. Further de development of the plane, and then the CUSA is used to resect the tumor. And microsurgical principles are applied using the micro scissors and the counter uh, 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 suction, bipolar coagulation, and further decrease of the tumor bulk. The anterior cerebral complex came uh, to a glimpse, and then this is the uh, left optic nerve, right optic nerve, and the infundibulum, and now the intracanalicular component of the uh, tumor is uh, uh, resected and uh, mobilized and coagulated on the right side and opening the left falciform ligament uh, in order to mobilize the intracanalicular component on the right because this is a very critical and important part 
of uh, uh, tuberculin cilia in angioma surgery for uh, obtaining a, a, a good uh, visual outcome. And the final adherent components are uh, taken out. And here is a view of the surgical field at the conclusion of surgery. Post-operative MRIs with cross-total uh, resection and she regained uh, uh, normal vision in about two weeks. Another example is an olfactory growth uh, um, meningioma. This is the pre-operative MRI uh, uh, shown here and post-operative MRI uh, showed a, a near total resection with a, a small residual here at the uh, uh, skull base and uh, it is being followed up, but she is doing uh, very well. The next case is a large multicystic hypoglossal schonoma in a, in a lady in her middle 40s who uh, uh, presented with this uh, tumor and she refused completely to do any combined approaches or uh, 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 cervical uh, incision. So uh, uh, a decision was taken to do a retrosigmoid approach and resect the tumor. Here is uh, the video of the procedure. The tumor is uh, uh, dissected away from the uh, arachnoid. Arachnoid is taken away and nerve stimulation is performed all over the surface. The 7 8 complex is seen here in, and is uh, uh, separated more separation of the uh, through the arachnoid uh, plane the spinal accessory nerve was very adherent to the nerve to the uh, tumor uh, surface and was dissected uh, bluntly and uh, sharply the tumor is dipping the the nerve is dipping into the tumor here and uh, bipolar coagulation on the capsule and opening the capsule and the bulking of the content is undertaken then sharp dissection of the arachnoid and separating the tumor capsule from the brainstem uh, vessels, further shrinkage of the tumor and uh, uh, resection using the uh, CUSA. Another component of the tumor situated anteriorly is bipolar coagulated and uh, its content are, contents are e evacuated, CUSA resection, And stimulation of the nerve of the spinal accessory nerve revealed no response at all. So I decided to sacrifice the nerve in order to try to resect the tumor completely. Uh, um, evacuation of the uh, contents. And also the pituitary ring tumor, ring uh, uh, forceps was very useful in uh, taking the tumor. Sharp dissection of the vessels and then bipolar shrinkage of the tumor and here the work is going on under the 45 angled scope. Uh, this is the uh, jugular foramen and the tumor is uh, taken from inside by bipolar coagulation because the tumor was very adherent and now the arachnoid is dissected. Uh, uh, a panoramic view of the trigeminal nerve, 7th, 8th nerve and 9th, 10th uh, complexes can be uh, seen here and the tumor is still attached through the arachnoid membrane, so it is uh, dissected of the ICA branches uh, uh, sharply. The brainstem also can be uh, uh, seen clearly here, and now the inferior component that is adherent to the uh, vertebral uh, artery is being dissected. This is the vertebrobasilar junction, and bipolar coagulation of some components of the uh, uh, last parts of the tumor below are uh, uh, de-anchoring the tumor. And this is a final view of the uh, two vertebral arteries and the vertebrobasilar junction and the dorsal aspect of the uh, uh, clivus. Post-operative MRI with the resection of the tumor uh, achieved except for the, uh, for the, the uh, uh, small part that is adherent to the jugular foramen because she underwent a previous uh, uh, surgery in uh, one center before she comes to our uh, uh, center in which no, 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 uh, it was uh, not successful in, in uh, resecting any of uh, the, the tumor and she just underwent a VP shunt insertion. This case was published as a, a video article in uh, uh, WNS in uh, World Neurosurgery in uh, 2020. The next case is a metastatic cervical adenocarcinoma in a 62-year-old lady, and uh, uh, she underwent uh, an eyebrow approach with a tubular uh, uh, retractor approach. 
the tumor content is biopsied, you can appreciate the, uh, uh, the tumor and the interface with the normal brain here, the tumor and the brain through the tubular retractor, endoscopic tubular retractor uh, 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 surgery, resection in the standard way using the uh, uh, forceps, More of the mucinous content from the cervical adenocarcinoma is uh, uh, resected. And now the double suction technique is very helpful in developing the plane between the uh, tumor and the surrounding brain. And also some degree of fine adjustment of the trajectory of the retractor brings the tumor more into the confines of the tubular retractor and enables it to be uh, uh, removed. Standard hemostasis in the usual uh, uh, fashion is performed here. And now after the surgery cell is uh, removed, a clean uh, uh, surgical bed is uh, uh, obtained. Post-operative MRIs with gross total resection. This is a non-contrast uh, uh, MRI, and this is post-contrast, just some uh, blood in the cavity, but the tumor was completely taken out. The next example is an extraventricular ependymoma in a 21-year-old uh, 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 boy. Here is a video of the procedure. The, note that the, the endoscope was used here in the, um, in the uh, exoscopic position because of the uh, uh, surface nature of the tumor and the tumor is being uh, debulked and a biopsy is uh, taken. And now the plane between the brain and the uh, tumor is uh, developed. This uh, uh, retractor is held by the assistant just uh, to support the brain. Uh, it is not a fixed retractor. And microsurgical resection in the standard way with the, with the, with the forceps and the CUSA as we uh, do in the uh, microsurgery uh, in every day. Again, the uh, double suction technique is very helpful in developing the plane of cleavage around the tumor. And the resection continues, developing more of the plane around the tumor components, bipolar coagulation of some tumor vessels. And then uh, 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 the tumor is uh, uh, taken out And the final part is uh, removed. One actively bleeding vessel is coagulated and hemostasis is achieved. And then uh, 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 the, the procedure is uh, concluded. Post-operative MRI with a gross total uh, resection. Another example of anaplastic xanthoastrocytoma in a 21-year-old uh, uh, lady. Preoperative MRIs are here up and uh, gross total resection is seen on the postoperative MRI. And one more example of a purely endoscopic excision of a frontal cryptic vascular malformation, opening uh, uh, the dura under endoscopic uh, control, a small opening tailored by the navigation, of course, and transsulcal dissection and axis. Note the hemosiderin stained cor cortex in the depth. The pointer of the navigation is showing the vascular uh, malformation and the, uh, the this is the, the, uh, the malformation uh, that has bled before the patient was having epilepsy and he was diagnosed with uh, uh, this after uh, developing an epileptic attack. Removal of the cortical and subcortical hemosiderin deposits. And bipolar coagulation to detach the malformation. And here is a clear uh, view after the uh, uh, resection. The next case is an endoscope controlled surgery for an intraventricular uh, 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 chiasmatic hypothalamic glioma in a very uh, young uh, child. I will not be showing the whole video uh, uh, here, but here is an initial view of the tumor that is seen 
uh, across the uh, uh, foramen of Monroe. Again, the same uh, 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 principles of the of the uh, uh, microsurgery are applied: hemostasis and uh, 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 by manual dissection, and uh, uh, then resection of the tumor and stopping short of its hypothalamic uh, attachment and also anteriorly to avoid visual uh, impairment in the uh, little child. The whole anatomy of the uh, uh, third ventricle is seen here with the uh, uh, rigid uh, uh, four millimeter scope and it was uh, very uh, helpful indeed. Post-operative MRIs here with uh, uh, complete resection of all the tumor except for the deliberately uh, left anterior component to save the vision. Another case of a Sega tumor uh, in a, a, a 34 year old uh, uh, patient. Snapshots from uh, the procedure are shown uh, uh, here. Everything is cleared at the uh, conclusion of the procedure of Raymond of Monroe. Pre operative MRIs are in the upper panel and post operative MRIs are uh, uh, down. And here is one example, another further example for the intraventricular uh, uh, lesions in which an endoscope controlled uh, uh, surgery is uh, performed. This is a case of a posterior callosal glioblastoma in a middle aged uh, uh, lady. Note that the tumor was not much enhancing because of its very aggressive uh, 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 nature. This is a video of the procedure under the navigation and uh, uh, the ependymal surface is seen. Initial coagulation of the tumor surface. Taking a sample and debulking. And then bipolar coagulation of some of the tumor attachments. A standard microsurgery, uh, sorry, standard microsurgery is uh, uh, utilized. Angled scopes and angled instruments for uh, uh, tumor resection. And going further, chasing the tumor and resecting it. And the resection goes on and the contralateral ventricular uh, uh, surface is uh, uh, seen and an external ventricular drain uh, was inserted under endoscopic uh, view at the conclusion. This is an early post-operative uh, MRI here on the left side. Uh, some degree of uh, uh, relatively good resection was uh, uh, achieved, as you can observe here. And this is a recurrence in three months uh, after receiving chemo and radio uh, therapy. And the final examples of intraventricular pathologies I will be showing you here is uh, this uh, hematoma suction in a case with a very giant callosal AVM that has been coiled before and was uh, bleeding recently, he had a very big clot into the ventricle, so a retractor, uh, a tubular retractor uh, uh, approach was used with the endoscope to uh, remove the uh, blood clots. This is a view of the frontal horn here. The choroid plexus at the region of the uh, uh, trigon and clots are taken out. This is very important to avoid prolonged external ventricular drains and infection and uh, the whole uh, uh, stuff of, of the uh, uh, complications of prolonged ETV. The temporal horn is seen using the, the 30 degrees scope and the frontal horn again. And here is the uh, caudate nucleus and some of the uh, parts of the hematoma that are adherent to the ependymal uh, uh, surface. And then finally, an external drain is uh, inserted. 
some technical considerations in these uh, cases is that the neuro navigation is a must using a low profile retractors of the scalp to have a more space suction irrigation sheath is very essential to give you a very uh, uh, smooth and seamless performance with the endoscopic view in order not to have to take it out every uh, 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 when it gets smudged also angled low profile instruments are very helpful planning a trajectory that follows the longitudinal axis of the tumor in intraaxial tumors and of course uh, uh, working on a slack brain and uh, 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 securing sufficient working space the position uh, uh, of uh, patients should be also taken in consideration, avoid extensive head extension uh, on, on contrary to the standard uh, 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 recommendations in microsurgery. And also the retrosigmoid approach should be uh, tailored in a way that gives you a proper uh, uh, space. So at the conclusion, I think that the frequently uh, raised concerns regarding the endoscope controlled surgery are easily overcome by the surgeon. Uh, increasing experience and are largely balanced by the careful anatomical and ergonomic uh, planning. The endoscope controlled surgery is doable, minimally invasive, and very effective with very uh, with uh, far superior operative visualization, less, less tissue damage, less need for brain exposure, and potentially lower complication uh, profile. And I, I, out of my solid belief in the importance of this type of surgery, I am editing uh, a book in, on endoscope controlled uh, transcranial surgery that's going to be published by Springer in uh, uh, next year. And it is a multi author uh, book that I hope it will help pushing uh, the edge in that uh, uh, field. And at the end, I would like to quote the uh, great economist and uh, thinker, uh, John Maynard Keynes, when he said, the difficulty lies not so much in developing new ideas as in escaping from old ones. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor, for a wonderful lecture, spectacular cases, and a beautiful quote at the end. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, um, uh, we have an international uh, audience today, so uh, since I don't see any questions in the chat, I would like to ask uh, for comments uh, for a neurosurgeon from Kazakhstan, Astana, Saparbek Saidbekov. Uh, if he is here, uh, Kamiloja, uh, we can unmute. Uh, yes. Uh -huh. Hello, everyone. Hello. Thank you for helpful and uh, helpful lecture. Dear Professor, I have a question. Can you talk about uh, double suction technique? Yes. You you like me to, to explain it more? Yes. Um, the, the issue is that you, instead of holding one forceps and one suction in your hand or one bipolar and one suction in your hand, you use the two suctions which are in the suitable uh, uh, power of suction. So one is pulling the tissue and the other is making dissection. So this helps gentle movement of the tissues away from the brain. And also one is pulling the tissue and the other is uh, clearing the blood and the things. So you have a gentle uh, movement of the tissue away from the normal brain. That's the, that's the main idea. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. You Pleasure. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, now I would like to uh, address the uh, Turkey uh, Selçuk University then, Professor Hakan Karaballı. Hello, happy new year for everyone. Uh, thank you for excellent lecture, Dr. Azap. Uh, I have three comments about your lecture. Uh, one of them, uh, we should have, we should have used the neuro navigation always, I think, if possible. Yes. Second comments about the uh, third uh, ETV. After the perforation, uh, uh, third ventricle, we should uh, check the prepontin system for extra membranes. Uh, third comments about the uh, double balloon. 
I mean neuroballon. I think neuroballon is very safe for the ETV. Uh, one question is about the correct plexus coagulation or uh, and or uh, resection. Uh, what are you thinking about the correct plexus coagulation after the ETV? You mean in uh, you mean in the pediatric cases? Yes, of course, of course. Uh, yes, I am uh, uh, usually uh, operated the pediatric yeah. patients. I am a pediatric neurosurgeon. Uh, actually, mostly. actually, I am I am mainly not a pediatric neurosurgeon. I am an <laughs> adult neurosurgeon in the majority of the cases. I think I think that this uh, uh, technique should be given a chance whenever it is needed. And uh, uh, we have lots of literature saying that the uh, choroid plexus coagulation works. Personally, I don't have that much vast experience, but as far as I think, it makes sense to help these kids to avoid something by whatever price. And there's no, uh, uh, I mean, you will lose nothing if you apply this on a large number of cases and see your results. And I know, so many of the uh, colleagues and friends who practice pediatric neurosurgery in uh, 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 in many areas of the world, in Egypt and in uh, in uh, South uh, America, they practice this, and it seems to be helping. So I think it should be adopted, not uh, abandoned. That's my opinion. Yes, thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, before we ask a question from the audience, uh, I was wondering what are your insights uh, about the artificial, the role of artificial intelligence and robotics in the neuroendoscopic development? I saw the uh, arm frame or robot in your pictures. So yes. how? Um, actually, this is a semi-robotic arm. Uh, mm -hmm. It is uh, something that is. It is not a fully robotic one. It, you just you just uh, uh, push one button and it moves very smoothly in all directions and you leave the button it it stays which is very very helpful and you you know it it, it negates the need for uh, an assistant holding the scope all the time and also it's very flexible so I think it is very uh, very handy uh, thing I just acquired this I will be uh, I, I, I I operated a couple of cases with this recently, and uh, we will be acquiring uh, the the machine for forever, uh, maybe in a few months. So I think it is very essential. One of the big problems with the fully robotic arms is the freezing, which uh, takes place at times. And uh, um, of course, we all know that at times you don't afford, you don't have the 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 uh, the the uh, capability to have uh, the the endoscope not seeing while you are operating, this might be uh, risky. Of course, I did not use it, but uh, this is what everybody is, uh, is saying. So um, I think the uh, human factor and the semi-robotic uh, uh, arrangement is much better. Thank you very much. Yeah. And as a for young neurosurgeons and neurosurgeons in our audience who are uh, looking into the specialized so specialize in your desk, what would be your advice? What are the trends and innovations we should keep our eyes I on? Think, I think that uh, neuroendoscopy will be a very important part of the future of neurosurgery. And um, because surgery is all about vision. And if you see it well, you can operate it well. And one of the very important things that are evolving now is the endoscopes, which are essentially an endoscope, but is outside the field and it is more ergonomic and easier, but still in some deeper parts of the uh, uh, brain surgery, at the very depth, you cannot use the endoscope as it is uh, uh, giving you the same view like an endoscope. So I think the future is a combination of both uh, technological development into, into this. But believe me, in 10 to 15 years, most of the thing will be done by an endoscope or an exoscope. Thank you very much for an honest answers and responses. Thank you very much. Thank now, uh, Professor... Uh... Musuju, do you have any additional questions? Or should we let Bektas Ajikus to make comments? Professor? 
thank you, Professor, for your excellent presentation thank you so much. Uh, and sharing your experience with us. The videos are excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you so can much. You please, can you please tell something about your personal experience on learning curve? Yes. The, the the learning curve is one very critical point of this. And I am so happy that you asked it, Professor, on this point. I started doing TVs and small, simple uh, uh, intraventricular stuff. And with time, when you when you have the capability, you grow into doing the benign pathologies. You do some uh, uh, colloid cysts, although not so perfectly, but you do them in a way or another until you gain the confidence and you get to that. And then after this, you can apply the more advanced things. In the middle of the thing, I learned how to do the pituitary and the endo, uh, endoscopic uh, endonasal and salvate. I was trained very well on the microsurgical uh, 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 pituitary surgery, and this was really very important part that shaped and made it easy because I, I know how to do the microsurgical pituitary and with the intraventricular uh, uh, endoscopy and some knowledge in anatomy courses and stuff, you gain the uh, uh, concept and then you apply. And by the end of the day, I have learned myself and try to acquire, which I am now doing mostly in most of the cases, the endoscope controlled surgery, which is something very uh, advanced. So before going into this, the young uh, neurosurgeon should have been trained a lot and uh, did a lot of uh, classical or uh, straightforward and microsurgery in addition to the endoscopic experience. Just a bit by bit, everything will come into a very big shape. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, Professor Suju, do you have any comments? Uh, or questions? No. I just only want to thank Professor Azab for this wonderful lecture. We have seen uh, amazing videos. I I think uh, the, these are the best videos I have ever seen about the endoscopic surgery by now. Uh, thank you so much. Very kind of you. Thank you so much. So much. Uh, I, I I think it was a great opening of the new year, 2024. The first lecture of this year was really amazing. And I, uh, again, congratulate you with the new year yeah. and I wish you all the best. <laughs> thank, thank you. you very By much. the way, your, uh, your lights are <laughs> behind <laughs> you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Reminding yeah. us that this is the first January. <laughs> yes. yeah. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you for the audience, for thank your you. participation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.